In this video, we'll take a look at another piece of vintage test equipment, the Heathkit IG37 FM Stereo Generator. FM Stereo Radio Broadcasting, introduced in North America in the 1960s, brought with it new requirements for radio testing and alignment. Test equipment that could generate FM stereo signals was required. The Heathkit IG112, offered from 1964 to 1967, was Heathkit's first FM stereo generator. It was replaced by the IG37, the subject of this video, which was offered from 1968 to 1976. It was followed by the IG5237, sold from 1977 to 1979, which was electrically identical but had a different color and styling. It also used BNC connectors in place of the Amphenol microphone type connectors of the IG37, but was otherwise identical. The IG37 was introduced in 1968 at a price of US $79.95. Like most Heath kits, it was offered as a kit that the user would assemble. It could be wired for 120 or 240 volts AC and weighed 9 pounds. The IG37 provides test signals for aligning mono and stereo FM radio receivers. It can produce the following signals. A monophonic FM signal that can be modulated by any one of three modulation frequencies, 400 hertz, 1 kilohertz, and 5 kilohertz. A composite stereo signal for either left or right channel modulated by one of three frequencies. A phase test signal, left plus right channel for adjustment of subcarrier transformers. A 19 kilohertz pilot signal with adjustable output level for checking the lock-in range of stereo receivers. A variable RF oscillator signal with adjustable sweep width and a nominal frequency of 100 MHz. Four marker frequencies for RF alignment checks. And two SCA, subsidiary communications authorization signal frequencies for SCA filter adjustments. The RF output provides shielded RF attenuators adjustable from 0 to 60 dB in 20 dB steps. The unit can be used for the following types of FM radio alignment. IF alignment, detector alignment, front end alignment, and FM stereo multiplex alignment. Some early FM receivers used a separate, sometimes optional, multiplex module for stereo decoding that typically plugged into the receiver. The IG37 can be used to test radios that use these adapter modules. The unit's in a brown case with side carrying handles that was common to a number of Heathkit test instruments of the era. At top left is the pilot level control which adjusts the level of the 19 kHz pilot carrier in the composite stereo signal from 0 to 10 percent. It also controls power to the unit. The function switch selects the internal signals that will be available at the output connectors. Specifically, RF sweep IF marker provides sweep at the RF out connector. Sweep width is adjustable from 0 to approximately 750 kHz. It also provides a crystal controlled 10.7 MHz signal at the IF marker connector plus four additional RF markers in the 88 to 108 MHz FM band. Audio and mono FM provides a sine wave signal of the selected frequency at the composite signal audio connector. It also provides a monophonic FM signal at the RF out connector. Phase test provides a composite stereo signal with both left and right channels in phase at the composite signal audio connector. The waveform can also be used to modulate the 100 MHz signal available at the RF out connector. Left channel provides a composite stereo left channel signal at the composite signal out connector. And right channel provides a composite stereo right channel signal at the composite SIG audio connector. The function level control adjusts the amount of RF deviation, amount of composite signal available, and amount of audio signal available. Frequency selects the frequency with which the RF signal is to be modulated or which is available at the composite signal audio connector. Selections are 400 hertz, 1000 hertz, 5000 hertz, 19 kilohertz, 38 kilohertz, and the SCA frequency, either 65 kilohertz or 67 kilohertz as selected on the back panel. Power on is a neon lamp which indicates the unit is powered on. The composite SIG audio connector furnishes either an audio waveform as selected by the frequency switch or a composite signal consisting of audio 19 kHz pilot and audio sidebands of the 38 kHz suppressed carrier. The IF marker connector provides a 5.35 MHz signal and harmonics to produce a 10.7 MHz IF marker signal plus markers in the FM band at 90.95 MHz, 96.3 MHz, 
101.65 megahertz and 107 megahertz, all harmonics of the 5.35 megahertz signal. Both of these outputs are screw-on amphenol type microphone connectors. The later IG5237 model switched to the more common BNC type of connector. The RF out connector provides radio frequency output in the FM band, either monophonic or stereo or RF sweep. A crystal type connector connects to a 300 ohm twin lead cable with test clips to attach to the antenna terminals of the radio receiver under test. The RF attenuator switches provide three 20 dB attenuators that can be switched in to decrease the magnitude of the RF output signal. Each 20 dB step corresponds to a factor of 10 reduction in output voltage. The RF frequency adjusts shifts the RF output frequency of the generator to allow selecting a test frequency that doesn't conflict with a local FM station. The sender frequency is approximately 100 MHz and can be adjusted plus or minus about 2 MHz. The rear panel has the power cord with some brackets for winding it for storage. A switch selects the SCA frequency used, either 65 kHz or 67 kHz. There's also access to three adjustments used during alignment of the unit. Taking a look inside, all circuitry is point to point using a metal chassis, tube sockets, and terminal strips. The unit uses six vacuum tubes, a 12AT7, 6AU8, 6AN8, and three 12AU7s. The RF oscillator modulator tube is shielded. At the top you can see the tubes, power transformer, and filter cap. Note the magnetically shielded power transformer. This lamp is used as a negative resistance device in the audio oscillator, which utilizes a Wien bridge circuit. The lamp doesn't light during operation. The large crystal is for 19 kilohertz, and the smaller one is for 5.35 megahertz. There's access to a number of trimmer caps and coils that are adjusted during alignment. At the bottom, you can see most of the passive components and wiring. Note the shielded compartment around the RF oscillator and separate shielding between each of the attenuator switches. You have to admit that the unit is in surprisingly good shape for something that was assembled around 45 years ago. Let's take a look on the oscilloscope at some of the signals that the unit can produce. It can produce audio output at frequencies of 400 hertz, 1000 hertz, and 5000 hertz as well as the 19 kilohertz pilot signal, the 38 kilohertz subcarrier, and the SCA frequency of either 65 or 67 kilohertz as selected on the back panel. The level can be adjusted with the function level control. And here's the composite signal consisting of the audio 19 kilohertz pilot and 38 kilohertz subcarrier. This is the 5.35 megahertz IF marker output. The first harmonic, 10.7 megahertz, is almost universally used as the IF frequency for FM radio receivers. Four additional harmonics are in the FM broadcast band and can be used as frequency markers for alignment. And finally, this is the RF output, which is nominally 100 megahertz. It can be varied from about 98 to 102 megahertz and the output level can be reduced by switching in the attenuators. This radio receiver is set to FM at 100 megahertz. We can turn up the function level and we can adjust the generator's frequency control to hear the modulation signal on the receiver. You can hear the 400 hertz, 1000 hertz, and 5000 Hz modulation signals when selected. You can't hear this because the video is mono, but if the radio is correctly tuned, we get audio in the left or right channel or both when the mode switch is changed. Also, the radio shows stereo mode or not. I bought this unit on eBay in August of 2018. It was in good cosmetic shape, but came with no manual. 
I found some partial manuals on the internet, but they were missing some key information like the locations of the test points. So I ordered a full manual from Manual Man, and as in the past, was very pleased with the high quality. As well as assembly, alignment, and theory of operation sections, the manual has extensive coverage of how FM stereo works and how the unit can be used to align FM stereo receivers of different types. The unit has the original microphone style connectors. A screw near one of the handles is not original, and it didn't include the original 300 ohm test leads, but everything else is complete and original. I first did some basic checks of resistance, then carefully powered the unit up, confirmed that all tubes lit up, and made voltage measurements as per the manual. It appeared to be basically working. I didn't find any resistors that were out of spec. I replaced one paper cap and most of the electrolytic capacitors except for the larger ones in the power supply since I had suitable new parts on hand for the others. In doing so I noticed that one of the electrolytic caps had originally been installed with the wrong polarity and seemed to have a puncture hole at one end so it was wise to replace it. I then went through the alignment procedure which I'll discuss next. The unit requires alignment after assembly. I think I would rate this as the most complex alignment procedure of any Heath kit I've worked on. It's quite a complicated process covering six pages of steps in the manual and requires an AC voltmeter, FM radio receiver, and oscilloscope. There are ten coils, three pots, and three trimmer caps that need to be adjusted. The major steps of the alignment include the 19 kHz oscillator adjustment, audio oscillator calibration, 38 kHz sync adjustment, balanced modulation adjustment, pilot level adjustment, operation check, modulation level check, and the RF oscillator adjustment. Some of the steps use an oscilloscope in XY mode to display Lissajous waveforms to check frequencies against each other. This was presumably to avoid the need for an accurate way of measuring frequency, such as a digital frequency counter, that the user of the time was not likely to have. I ran through the alignment procedure. One step uses two precision resistors that were included with the kit but are no longer with it because they're temporarily added to the circuit and then removed. I tried out the procedure using some resistors of similar value. I ended up using a different procedure of just adjusting the 38 kilohertz oscillator to free run at 38 kilohertz as measured by a frequency counter. I noticed that some of the signals have a significant amount of 60 hertz ripple on them. This is coming from the power supply. After checking out the power supply circuit and experimenting with adding more filter capacitance, I concluded that this is normal for the unit. I got through most of the alignment but had trouble with the pilot level adjustment section. After a considerable amount of debugging, I noticed that the two trimmer caps that are mounted as a unit on the back panel were installed reversed. The two trimmers are of different values, so it makes a difference which way they get installed. The original assembly had reversed them. Unsoldering and correcting it got the unit to properly align. This would imply that the unit had never actually worked properly. It would have produced audio and mono FM signals, but the stereo output modes would not have worked correctly since the time that the unit was assembled in the 1970s. I've seen similar issues with some other Heath kits I've restored. This might explain why the unit didn't appear to have been heavily used. After alignment, I was able to pick up stereo signals on an FM radio with a test tone in either both left only or right channel only, depending on the selected mode. The IG37 was one of three models of FM stereo generators produced by Heathkit. It's one of the rarer units to show up at flea markets and eBay, likely because it was a more specialized piece of equipment, more likely to be used by professional radio technicians than hobbyists, and many units were likely discarded as they're not of much use today. It has some unusual circuitry and a complicated alignment procedure. Offered until 1976, and its almost identical successor until 1979, it was somewhat late for a tube-based design to be still on the market. No solid-state unit ever replaced it. I hope you enjoyed this look at a piece of vintage test equipment. If so, please check out my other videos on test equipment and amateur radio and shortwave products.